Hello and welcome to The Garden Log. This is number 86 and I am Ben Dark. I am a gardener and this is a gardening podcast. If 2021 is the first year in which you have listened to gardening podcasts, then welcome. The general format is I describe my working week as a head gardener up in the Chiltern Hills. There is a little bit of plant learning tucked away in there somewhere and all sorts of, of lessons for life. This week the lessons are how not to be a complete and utter prat all of the time. Then there is advice on how to garden with a hangover, how to garden in a state of utter fatigue. That section involves a pickup truck and a shovel, but for most of the rest of the podcast you won't really need any extra props. I am speaking to you from early January, and the events of this week all took place in early January 2021. So if you are a visual person and you would like to conjure a picture of me while this was going on, imagine a gardener wrapped in as many layers as he can possibly fit with a very hot cup of tea in his hands at almost all times, and you'll get pretty close to, to my visage for the rest of the week. If you are not a visual person, you're more of an audio person, then I suggest we get on with the week in gardening. Welcome to the week in gardening. Monday saw the gardening team returning to their garden after the Christmas break. I tend to get in first and open things up and normally I use that time to drink a cup of coffee. We've got an incredible gardener's coffee machine. One of those chrome coffee things that you'd you'd see in a cafe with the, the little rod for foaming milk and, and handles that you clunk in place satisfyingly and, and a big hopper on top that grinds out. It's a, an exceptional bit of kit. I sometimes wonder what the garden would look like had we been bought a, a, a Japanese tea set instead. Or perhaps a, a milkshake making machine. Would the garden be more frenetic? less caffeinated, more mellow? It's an interesting question, and one that I suspect will not get any further study. Anyway, normally I use that time to make myself a coffee and think about what's going to go on in the day. But on Monday I went out in the darkness, straight over to the tree fern grove. It had been worrying me over the two weeks off. Not, not exclusively, I didn't want anyone to think that I had ruined my Christmas holidays with worry over these plants, but occasionally between glasses of wine and little, little nibbles, I'd think of a, of a dark garden, and I'd think of a tall yew hedge, and in its shade, these little plants all the way from the other side of the world, already cold and getting colder as the night went on. I spent a lot of time refreshing my, my weather app, in which the, the location of the garden is pinpointed, and watching the, the minus numbers stack up. A couple of times I did have my finger poised and ready to text one of my colleagues who lives a lot closer to the garden than I do, and say, could you possibly go up the hill and, and stick some hay in the top of those unprotected tree ferns? But I stayed strong. I did not crumble. The tree ferns remained completely unprotected all winter. We got days of minus three. We got days where the temperature didn't tip above one degree. And I had this little cut from my head that if I saw minus five, I was going to get someone in. And if I saw a day where the temperature didn't go above minus two, minus one, I was going to get someone in. But actually, we have just about skirted above them. And... I went on Monday morning and, and got that little torch from my phone, it was still dark, and looked at the tree ferns, and they are still utterly beautiful, utterly evergreen still. They haven't defoliated, they've got little nests of, of leaves on top, of lovely crispy dried beech leaves, and I'm almost certain that the fronds down there below are going to be absolutely fine. 
I waited for it to get light and in the light you can really see the colours and the last circle of fronds to unfurl from each of the tree ferns is still so fresh and tauntingly green. If I was winter I would be seriously considering throwing something polar, something to get rid of these these taunting green fronds. I think with tree ferns, from what I've understood, there are four levels of, of damage done by the cold. One is the frost damage to the exposed tips of the fronds. So you get a little, little blackening on the edge of them as if they've been seared by, by a blowtorch. The next is complete defoliation which probably happens at around minus six, minus seven, a bit higher. The third one is damage to the little croziers, the little, little rolled up bits of fern that are still tucked in the crown beneath that orange orangutan fur that they clad themselves in. And then the fourth stage is the, the horrendous one. That's the, the frozen through completely dead tree fern. We suffered a couple of those in the, the beast from the east disaster of, of spring 2018. And I think it's really caused by days on end without a thaw, days on end for frost to creep its way right through that trunk, to creep below those, those hairy frond covers and seize things up completely. All of this is to say that we're a long way from that stage yet. And I started to be very happy that what I had known scientifically w was borne out in the evidence in the garden. Otherwise, I spent the day going around getting acquainted with all of the old favourite friends in the garden that, not that I hadn't seen for two weeks, but that I hadn't seen for almost a year because there are things you ignore. There are things that just get shoved to the, to the side of the horticultural consciousness until this time of year. So it was really nice to, to go around and look at all the hammer mellus again and see all of the hellebores, particularly the hybrid hellebores, starting to flower. They, they're at little compressed flower stage at the moment. They look like bubbles, bubbles of some sort of methane gas released from a vent at the very, very bottom of the ocean, at the bottom of a deep sea saltwater trench. And they're all compressed and tiny, but as they float up, they're going to expand and get more wobbly edged and, and beautiful as they enter the, the big, light, warm water of the surface. And that warm water of the surface, obviously, is the spring air. And that warm water of the surface is coming. And in, in a couple of weeks, the hellebores are going to be out and the early exploratory bumblebees will be, will be tumbling up into those, into those downturned crowns. It's going to be wonderful. It's all on its way. I thought of some more underwater imagery on the way home. I know I get accused of, of using too many military images in this podcast, but I think underwater is actually more frequent. More, more underwater was when I left work on the Monday. It's just light enough to see a little bit now. What joy. From late November for, for a month and a half, I've been cycling every part of the journey home in the dark. But now for the five minutes after I leave work, it is light. And at this time of year, you see things you've never seen before because the hedges are bare. You can see into gardens that would normally be, be walled off behind, behind the green branches. And so I was able to see this very strange sloping garden on the way home. And there was almost nothing in it. It was very, very overgrown. Overgrown stage where it was thick grass just turning into to bramble as an ash seedling. And amongst this was this phalanx, this army of the black-leaved formium plant. And they... Um, the black leaf formium, by the way, is, it's New Zealand flax. It's a very, very long, strappy, spiky leaf. If you imagine a, a, an iris that had been dipped in, in squid ink and then multiplied in size by by 500. It looks like, like one of those big, big clumpy things. And I saw this army of those marching down the hill and looking exactly like sea urchins. It looked like you'd snorkeled over some, some cleft in a coral reef and spotted down there a huge, dark army of these advancing spiky black sea urchins. <laughs> 
It's amazing the effects that can be produced by a garden. Some people would have would have planted apples there and maybe a pear in the rough grass. But these people went went full formium and, and good on them for that. During the day, before getting on the bicycle and seeing that, I obviously had to do a little bit of gardening. It was mainly tidying up, tidying up the sticks brought down from the treetops by the winter winds, mostly dead wood that had been hanging around up there for some time and, and was due for a shaking out. On Tuesday, I went to the garden after a night almost completely without sleep. Not not through tree fern worry, but, but through a member of the next generation of darks. So I came to work feeling slightly destroyed. Fatigue is a funny thing. It's, it's like a, a decaffeinated hangover. The chemical element's gone, but the, the general ambience of the hangover remains pretty much in place entirely. A headache and a, and a general lack of will to live. There were bits of light snow fuffing and scudding around under very grey skies. It wasn't really a day for skilled work, for anything cold-fingered. It was not a day for overly repetitive tasks, for things carried out again and again over long, unremitting hours of cold and tedium. So I did some rough work. It's good to keep some rough work in the in the back. It's good to keep some rough work in the to be done pile for days like this, for days when doing needs to happen. So I repaired a, a potholy crude track. This was was a piece of a piece of track that has developed ruts and, and potholes. And I stood on the back of a pickup truck with a bag of MOT type one. That's Ministry of Transport Type 1 sub-base. It's what they build motorways on. The, uh, the Ministry of Transport has specified the type of rock they want. And um, you can go and buy it. You can go and buy Ministry of Transport approved Type 1 stuff and um, throw it on your own road, just like it's the M4. So I did that, chucked that off the back of the pickup truck into the various potholes and then went out with a whacker plate. The whacker plate always reminds me of of the monopods, those creatures from, is it the Voyage of the Dawn Treader? One of the Narnia books, the big mushroomy things that, that sleep under their upturned foot and hop about the place. So they're based on a, a piece of marginalia, you find them in, in medieval manuscripts and the, and the travels of Sir John de Mandeville and stuff like that. Anyway, the whacker plate's a bit like that, it's a big steel foot with a very heavy engine on top and all the engine does is, is judder itself around so that the whole thing hops onto the ground and smashes it down and it really is quite effective you feel the ground thrumming and shaking under your feet as you are driving it along the whole thing vibrating like a tiny localized earthquake it's horrendously noisy and, and obvious which is the kind of work that actually counterintuitively you should be doing where when hungover or, or generally tired and clapped out on Wednesday, I had managed to sleep. I came into the garden. It wasn't perfect sleep. I came into the garden after having this very strange dream where I had been in the garden. And it was obviously the garden in which I worked, but it looked nothing like it somehow. Obviously, the essence was there because I recognised it straight away. But, but actually, if we put together the pieces, there, there, was, there was nothing really in common. Uh, they had a vast ornamental lake in the bottom lawn. And I was there at tulip time. The tulips had all come out, and each one of them was blood red. And it was reflecting in the water and lighting up the bottom of these low clouds in this blood red colour. And I was standing there thinking to myself, gosh, that's a very bold planting choice. Did I, did I choose them that bold? Did I really feel that apocalyptic when I was picking out the, the tulips last September? And there were little groups of people standing around, overwhelmed by it all. And the dream didn't specify whether they were overwhelmed in a good or bad way. They were sort of supporting themselves and burying their heads in each other's shoulders. The tulips were those very dark-leaved red riding hood types, you know, where they have the, the little red 
red stripes in the, in the, in the dark green of the leaves. So they looked fairly unnatural in that respect as well. We shall have to wait until real tulip time to see if, if my premonition comes true. If the bulbs do all come up as droplets of unnatural blood, then we will know that, that I am some sort of prophet and that the garden log episodes 1 to, to 85 should be combed through for, for my words. Wednesday was Twelfth Night, which meant there were a lot of Christmas trees hanging around. Uh, the Christmas trees of the house, of the staff, of everyone. So that was a good, fun job. Loppers and saws and chippers, all of them smushed and smashed into little bits of, of fir tree compost ameliorant. They all went into the heap to be to be swallowed up by the, the great mound. I noticed the first snowdrops starting to show, starting to show that little that little tinge of white on an upright green stalk. They've got a long way to go, they've still got to grow up all the way to their full height, then tilt over and then wait for that magical moment where the flower head swings three from the stalk. I spent the day tidying up some ground cover roses. These are, are roses in the grouse series. There are a couple of a couple of different types and there's a new one called Grouse Two Thousand or something. A very a very serious rose breeder name. And they are designed to to be a mat of of flower. They don't really work like that. They're not actually any use as a ground cover. There is too much gap between them. If you think of how a rose grows in, in any situation, it, it grows by stalks, by extension growth. It's never going to, to cover the ground. So a, as ground cover, they, they cover the ground in sort of the way that a, a fishnet tight covers a leg. There's lots of, of space in between the, the thing itself. And in that space, the weeds grow, which is a pain. It means in the summer, when you're, when you're trying to, to weed through the roses, you get all of the stems clawing at the, the back of your, your hand, lots of thorns etching, etching you with this crisscross modern art pattern. It's a pain, so my advice would be don't, don't plant them as a ground colour. I think they'd probably look very good ramping off the, the edge of a, a cliff or in a very rustic planter where they could tumble down. Maybe we should just call them tumbling roses, not ground cover roses. I've been misled once again by, by words. With us, they look best where they have a little bit of, of support, actually, where they go along the ground a bit, and then they ramp off into a five-bar gate that never really moves. It's always, it's always closed. And they ramp off into the, into the lower bars and, and the cross beam of that and there they look perfect they flower sprays of little little single flowers behaving like a very miniature climbing rose really there they are fantastic otherwise they're a pain i didn't dig them out though i, I just pulled all of the the trailing straggling branches together in one big twisted bit of rope like I was giving the world's most rudimentary haircut to a ponytailed person and sawed the whole lot of it off so that when they sprang out of my, my grasp there was only four inches of stem going out in every direction. It's not a subtle way of preening but I think it's all they deserve and I generally treat treat roses in a, in, in a similar manner. When this garden is finished and there aren't landscaping tasks to do all the time when there aren't great massive rocks to move around and, and paths to fill in and things to build and, and lay and slabs and stuff. I will do proper rose pruning. I will be a fastidious gardener whose every cut is at 45 degrees just above the bud and I will spend weeks on it and I will really enjoy myself. I'll get some good audio books, I'll listen to some symphonies, I'll listen to all of the other gardening podcasts out there. But for now, all of the roses in the garden are going to get samurai willy-nilly, and I'm sure we'll be just as good for it. As I was walking to the chipper with my masses of, of rose prunings, I noticed that the crocuses are coming up in, in lawns and under tree areas. And I went to have a little look at them because it's always a cheering sight to see the first of, of any new bulb. If anyone's seen a crocus in its early stage, it's a little white sheaf 
with a, a pineapple crown of green leaves coming out of the top, only an inch and a half high at the moment. And it reminded me incredibly strongly of this tiny little soft toy leek that my little son was given when he was a few days old. And that made me very cheerful for, for some reason, because I could picture a little smiley face on each, on each crocus like that little toy had. And I thought it was nice that plants that we are so familiar with, plants that I have done things with, been in the vicinity of every year for, for decades, can suddenly take on new associations and meanings. And that will stick there in the catalogue of crocus associations for the rest of my life, which is, is nice. We just, we just keep adding to our experiences. It was, it was very pleasing. On Thursday, I was at home with the baby himself. We went for a good walk. We found a little tiny tropical front garden near me, which I'd never seen before. A little street had never been down, and it was very tantalising because there were sheets of fleece strewn about the place. Obviously, there are treasures underneath. And there were all of these Pseudopanax crassifolius stuff hanging around. And um, Pseudopanax crassifolius is the most horrendous plant. It's admirable in, in its ugliness, almost. It's a plant that only Pseudopanax lovers could love. You might have seen it. It's not very common. It looks like a big stick, like a thin, tall stick, a bamboo cane, if a bamboo cane were painted black. And from that bamboo cane hang long strappy leaves that look like they've died and not died recently died several years ago died in a fire singed black floppy leaves and if you go up close to them you'll notice that these foot and a half long two centimeter thick strappy leaves have this very interesting dull yellowish greeny midrib all down the center and this, this orangey midrib in the blackish green of the leaf makes the whole thing sort of have the gunky display mating colours of, of a newt that you might find at the bottom of the pond. It's, it's very exciting to, to see them. And I admire people who plant these, even though, even though I, I, I can't abide them myself, because they're so far from a, a keeping up with the Joneses. Uh, kind of plant you have to do it because you have a have a strange obsession like those people who who adore the, the ugliest dog going it's for them and them alone so that was very exciting much like the the new associations of the crocus it's nice to find a new place in 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 a few minutes walk of, of one's own house that now can become a, a point on the horticultural compass can be a place that i can stop and, and see through the years see what on earth is under that fleece see what that interesting climber that is now bare and denuded but looks to me like something quite fun might be on friday i was back at work a very very cold day again every day this week was freezing a light icy snow was falling in the darkness as I cycled up to work and the, the first thing we did when we got in was to light a brazier by the area we we're going to be working in with old pallet wood so that on our breaks we would be able to, to warm our fingers and, and have somewhere to, to put our boots near to warm up. We were working on, on a planting scheme. There were four of us and we were planting large standard yews. These yew trees with bare trunks up to, to five foot and then a, and a puffy pom-pom up to maybe eight, eight foot, nine foot in the air. And eventually they'll be pruned into to some sort of formal shape, but we haven't got as far as deciding what that shape will be. And it was a it was a good, exciting day. There was the ring of mattocks and trenching shovels and post hole diggers and there was cold air and snowflakes and, and wood smoke. And we got on with things. I infuriated everyone by, by moving the location of some of the trees after the holes had already been dug. But I think it was a service. I'd like those those gardeners to know that I was trying to keep them warm. I was trying to keep keep blood in their fingertips. We could have gone on pruned wisteria, but, but that would have led to, to frozen hands. So, so as it was, we, we got those, those trees into the ground. They're going to form a, a formal informal walkway. 
They are planted at fairly regular intervals but at completely different heights because they are on either side of, of a path that rises and falls and runs between flower beds with, without crops of rock and things in them so that when you look at it you can see there is rhythm there, there is some structure, there is, there is a guiding mind behind this chaos but at the same time you, you don't have an avenue as such. It's quite an exciting idea and I hope that it's going to, to come off. I have to admit there are leftover plants, leftover from a hedge on stilts that we've been putting in. And so this could be a, a serendipitous discovery, or it could be a case of, of parsimony and an unwillingness to, to let things go to waste, ruining what was a, a perfectly good area of the garden. We'll really only know in a, in a year or two when the topiary effect has started to kick in. And that was it. That day ended a satisfying winter week of real cold and real work. I left as I had entered, worrying about the tree ferns. The temperatures were predicted to go down to minus three again over the weekend. Still predicted to, actually. I'm recording this on the Saturday afternoon, and I think tonight is going to plummet once more. We had the the straw ready for stuffing, but... Once again, held firm. So they are there. Think of them now. They're unprotected in the darkness. Anyway, those tree ferns have had quite enough attention this week. We, we don't want to spoil them. Let's get on and see if I have any recommendations. Just one recommendation this week, and it is tangentially horticultural, though though it might seem a little a little odd at first. I've been reading the last volume of the Cecil Beaton Diaries, the the version compiled by by Hugo Vickers, and it's fun because generally Cecil Beaton is a horrendous, horrible, mean penned old snob. Most of the diaries spent discussing how drab the guests said at the aristocratic dinners that he's climbed all his life to get invited to and now and now is is terribly bored with her. He's a constant litany of encounters with various fatuous bores and anonymous non entities. I'm just going to read you a, a very short bit where he is writing in his diary about a very famous and utterly gorgeous actress that he's been to see in a play. I only read this because it makes his writing about gardening that I'm going to share with you later all the more remarkable. Here we go. I found her performance mechanical and inept, her timing is erratic. She stops and laughs, she falters over words, she is maladroit and she is ugly. That beautiful bone structure of cheekbone, nose and chin goes for nothing in the surrounding flesh of the New England shopkeeper. Her skin is revolting, and since she does not apply enough makeup, even from the front she appears pockmarked. In life her appearance is appalling, a rattled, rash-ridden, freckled, burnt, mottled, bleached and wizened piece of decaying matter. It is unbelievable, incredible, that she can still be exhibited in public. The, the diaries are full of this sort of thing. It really is, it really is horrendous to read, but, but quite entertaining. The only sections where he seems genuinely unaffected and happy are the gardening sections where he's gone down to his, his beautiful house in Wiltshire for, for the weekend. And he, he writes brilliantly about that. He writes better than many gardening writers. There's a fantastic section in the middle of the book on page 216 about weeding and how weeding is an activity for, for a happy mind. It is an activity to, to lose yourself in repeated phrases and little bits of happy speculation and just let the afternoon flow along. And after spending this afternoon weeding, he, he writes in his diaries of the final moment where he triumphantly takes his, his weeds to the compost heap. And here I heave the truck in the air, turn it upside down and give it a good shake so that its contents will fall among small pieces carnation stalks. As in drowning, the past falls before me. But these are the contents of one afternoon, 
there among the ground cell, the bits of stinging nettle that I dared to clutch, the nasty large hairy leaves of a few thistles, a lot of dead roses and brown lilac clusters. Oh yes, there is the mildewed peony that I had topped as I stopped to admire the pink and white garden at its height now. And there are the iris stalks. Lastly, caught in the wooden slats of the trug, a few little tufts of weeds that spelled two o'clock when I first came out on the terrace for the afternoon's activity. And Smallpiece, relaying news from his wife, tells me that tea is ready. And here, this is a man genuinely happy, who has spent an afternoon absorbed in nothing but the, the herbaceous contents of his piece of lands. I think it, it's an advert for not necessarily the fact that gardening is, is a great thing for, for well-being, but it's an advert for the fact that it's very hard to be actively a nasty person while in the act of gardening. I'm not certain it's a book I'd recommend rushing out and buying for its horticultural insight, but if you happen to have a copy lying around, I'm sure some people do, read it again in terms of its gardening content. Go to the index and look for Small Piece, who was Beaton's gardener. Read the sections where Cecil Beaton and Small Piece are getting the garden ready for the village's open day, where everyone's going to tramp around the garden. Read Cecil Beaton's pride that he sees in his garden, relayed through his descriptions of Small Piece's pride. Small Piece is repeatedly described as, as getting 20 years younger every time someone praises him on one of these open days. He writes as if Small Piece were were some ancient and and he a thrusting young man but actually if you watch if you watch there's a documentary um beaten by bailey on youtube and you can see small piece in the background of one one of the gardening shops and they're two old men staggering around this garden together equally as decrepit as each other it's very interesting anyway go and seek that out if you can or just take a lesson from it and find the most viperous mean-spirited vinegary person in your life and see if you can get them interested in in their garden a few very quick thank yous i'd like to thank jonathan bykowski again elizabeth again and eileen charnley again for their donations to the podcast this week thank you very much that is january and february's hosting fees all paid and ticked off already so much appreciated if you'd like to join them you can do so at ko-fi that's ko hyphen fi slash ben dark a more general thank you to all of you for tuning into the garden log in this new year i hope that wherever you are you manage to stay warm and that none of your most precious things get frozen off in the cold that is to come. I will be back next week with another episode of The Garden Log. Until then, I hope you have a wonderful week, whether you manage to get out into the garden or not. Thank you very much for listening and goodbye. <laughs>